Thank you, thank you, and thank you. I'm Robert McBride of All Classical FM. This is Carlos Calmar, the music director of the Oregon Symphony. Good evening. And coming in tonight, we were wow. uh, looking at this thing which is in your program, Symphony Supper at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. This is a new thing. A musician well done. It sort of harmonizes with your shirt, kind of. We'll, we'll perfect that by Well, now. if I come to Next the pre-concert talk and blood is dripping out of my mouth, you know where I have been. Okay. Oh, no, you I'm... like it rare, do you? Oh, of course. <laughs> We're going to have blood dripping down the faces of the horn players by the end oh, of the yeah. first piece tonight, I think. <laughs> Whoa, okay. So, Christopher Rouse, Sergei Prokofiev, with soloist Alban Gerhardt, and Antonin Dvorak. Uh, the New World Symphony, the second half of the show, the piece that everybody loves, which is nice around Thanksgiving time because we think of it as such an American thing, the symphony from the New World, which he wrote in New York. Carlos is going to tell us that it's not really an American work at all, but he's going to spoil it for us. But First, let's talk about this crazy little piece by Christopher Rouse. Now, Christopher Rouse is a living American composer. He's written quite a number of things inspired by ancient Greek mythology, including the first piece on tonight's concert, which is all about a wild chariot ride across the sky, which does not end well. Not really. No. Uh, Christopher Rouse actually is a, a composer whose music um, we have heard, if you are a regular subscriber for our concert and have been so for the last seven to eight years. Um, I mean, it's quite a, a long time ago, but we have done two pieces by him already. One was called Fantasmata, um, and the other was a percussion concerto. I know that you, everybody here, as so do I, adores uh, Colin Curry. He's coming back next season, of course. He's such a great percussion soloist, and one piece that he did is called the Gerettete Alberich, Alberich Saved, which is uh, pretty much an invention of what happens after uh, the last opera of the Ring Cycle uh, by Wagner is over. I came to that concert knowing nothing about that piece at all, yeah. except the title, I thought with Alberich, as this has something to do with the Ring Cycle, Downbeat, the first music that pours off the stage is that gorgeous melody from the end of the ring, which is the most exactly. beautiful thing Wagner ever wrote. Yeah. And I, it just took my breath away. And then he went on from there with all his crazy yeah, well, stuff. It's, uh, one, one thing in Christopher Rao's music is it's this slightly quirky uh, sense of humor because it's ring cycle is over and uh, there is this, 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 there is Alberich and what happens? And he's there and... <laughs> okay, that's where it started uh, with uh, that music. Now, the music you're going to hear tonight is absolutely not that part. It's not ironic. It's really very serious music. Um, and actually, it reminded me a little bit, uh, if we go back into programming uh, into last season, I think it was last season, um, the first concert by the Oregon Symphony was opened by a piece, uh, I don't know whether you have been there and remember it, by a composer from Thailand called Narong Prang Charoan. And I remember standing in front of all of you and saying, this piece that you're going to hear is very high energy. And then I explained a little bit about what it was about. And then I said something like that the composer, being Asian and being a Thai, and having Buddhist thoughts in him said, uh, don't resist if music of high energy comes at you, just let it go through you and it will not hurt. <laughs> that went very well back then. Now, in essence, Rouse is, uh, doesn't say that and he's not Asian either, but uh, it, the piece we are going to play for you tonight reminded me of that because if you thought that the piece by Narong Prang Charoeng was high energy and very in your face and has dangerous energy. Think, just wait until you hear what will happen tonight because this is so over the top music. It's completely 
wacky. Um, the story actually is quite simple. There is uh, Phaeton, uh, who is the son of uh, Helios, who is the god of the sun. And uh, what happened in Greek mythology is that Phaeton kind of doubted whether Helios is really his dad, and, you know, children can be very nasty. So he made, uh, he was kind of pestering uh, with that, so uh, finally Helios said, to prove that I'm your dad, I will do whatever you ask me for. And pretty much the minute he, Helios, the god of the sun, said that, he should have regretted it. Don't promise your children anything. Yeah, and how would that prove anything anyway? Don't ask me, it's okay, Greek never mythology, mind. you never mind. <laughs> so, what does this little uh, Phaeton do? He says that, or you, to prove that you are my dad, I want to drive uh, the chariots of the sun, on which Helios drives across this, the sky. And Helios, of course, says, you are too young, you don't have the ability to do that, don't. But Phaeton just insists, and so uh, Helios just hands him over the reins of this horse carriage that goes over this, the, uh, it's the carriage of uh, the chariots of uh, the sun. Now, Phaeton goes into this ride, and as soon as he goes into that, he loses control uh, over the horses, and the horses go completely crazy. It's a nutcase going wild. And the, the carriage hits the earth, destroys plantations, the rivers dry up, and it gets so out of control and dangerous that um, the, this carriage out of control even threatens Olympia. So the god of all gods, seeing that, throws a thunderbolt and kills Phaeton. That's the story in Greek mythology. Now, of course, me being me uh, and having kind of a vivid fantasy, I thought like, well, it's, it's, I can relate to that story. Uh, not to the ending, but to the story, yes, because imagine yourself having uh, sons, children, uh, adolescent children, who just learned how to drive a car, and you have in your home this Cadillac you have been working for 10 years and saved, and finally you bought an expensive Cadillac, and you treasure it, and you, your boy says, Dad, I want to go for a ride on your car, and you say, no, 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 not on my car, it's expensive, you can't drive that. Far. And the boy pesters and pesters you, and finally, because you love your son, you give in. I'm so glad I have only daughters. Uh, <laughs> And you, gi you give in and you give him the, the, the keys and uh, the son drives off with your expensive car and half an hour later you get this call by whoever and uh, you hear the car was totaled. That's pretty much what happens in the piece you're going to hear by Christopher Rouse. Except it's the orchestra members that are totaled. The, yeah, they, uh, who is totaled is the orchestra members. Now, um, because I sit... There is one other piece that describes the same phenomenon uh, that, uh, that I just told you, which is by Camille Sanson. But Camille Sanson focuses mainly on the entire story, meaning the doubts, the ask for give me the, the keys to you, to, well, give me the reins to the chariots of the sun, etc. Whereas Rouse focuses only on the ride itself. It starts at huge speed. And uh, within two minutes, you hear that something goes wrong. And there is one little section in this music that is very, very fast, where you will hear the horns of the Oregon Symphony going completely crazy. And it sounds like horses out of control. And if towards the end, after, let's say, five and a half minutes, you think this is so unbearable, fast and very very, very, very loud, wait until you hear the ending. Because if you think, if you think that at the end, Phaeton is killed by a thunderbolt, well, that's what you're going to hear. Fun, please. 
And then your ears will get a little bit of a break as you reset the stage. You'll bring out one of those little platforms for the cellist to be on, probably, right? Something about this song? Huh? Okay. And then Alban Gerhardt, German cellist, a good friend of yours, and you guys have worked together a lot, including here several times. You'll team up for a piece by Prokofiev called a Symphony Concerto. I've never seen this thing live. I've heard recordings a couple of times over the past three decades or so, and I kind of, yeah, it didn't really do much for me. But this week I've been listening to it, and the more I hear it, the more I like it. It's a really, really substantial piece, uh, and, and especially for a cellist, it's, it's, it's a monster. I mean, you've got to have incredible talent, but also the ability to project that with a kind of serenity, I think. You can't be frenetic about it. It's got to be solid somehow, don't you think? I, I think that one, uh, I, I mean, okay, we are talking about a piece that is fairly un unknown because it's not being played as often as it should. And one thing that I can tell you in advance about the interpretation of this wonderful cellist, Alban, is that he is uh, very straightforward very, um, in a way, he doesn't waste any time going into schmaltz and stuff like that. Because he, let's remember that one side of uh, Prokofiev, a side that we actually all adore, meaning the side that is lyrical, that uh, has so great melodies that we all love from pieces like Romeo and Juliet, um, that can be done with great enthusiasm, great passion, and you kind of get lost in that kind of thing. And uh, Alban, his idea of this piece is not like that at all. So, and probably one of the reasons why it is not at all is we are talking about, uh, mainly this is a concerto for cello and orchestra. Mind the title that under which it is published. Now, um, what happened is that Prokofiev wrote this concerto um, at a certain time in his life and presented it to the public and it was a disaster and as people say who attended that performance it was a disaster mainly because of the soloist because the soloist, Russian cellist Lev Beresovsky pretty much un misunderstood the piece and did exactly what I've just described. He went into schmaltzy, sentimental, slow stuff, and probably he didn't practice the virtuosic stuff either. Audience didn't like it, nobody liked it. Concert disappeared. Now, a little bit later, there was this very young student uh, of cello in uh, former Soviet Union, uh, by the name of Mstislav Rostropovich. And this Rostropovich took it upon himself to play the piece in concert, this unsuccessful piece. And in that concert Prokofiev was in the audience and he was like, wow, there is somebody who actually understands what I meant. And Prokofiev went, introduced himself to Rostropovich and said to him, I want to work on this piece, I want to rewrite it, and I want to rewrite it for you. So he, he actually wrote the piece pretty much a second time, and that is the piece that you're going to hear. So it's a um, rewriting of the first concerto is the Symphony Concerto for Cello and Orchestra, Opus 125, and of course, history has shown, Rostropovich um, played the premiere, it was very successful, and it became what we could call a standard repertoire for cellists. Now remember that cellists travel around the world, and um, essentially you can imagine that, first of all, you don't see so many cell cellists as soloists in a symphony concerto, and second, poor cellists. Then finally, the music director of an orchestra makes up his mind and says, we shouldn't invite always violin and piano, let's do a cello once in a while. And what does everybody ask? Dvorak. Dvorak, yeah. So these wonderful people play Dvorak and Dvorak and Dvorak and Dvorak. 
And every cellist I know says Dvořák is the best of the best of the best. But once you have played it for 425 times, you want to do something else. So this is one of the... Con and then you do uh, 250 times the Elgar Concerto, and 125 the Sanson, and then you are like, give me something else. And then there is this. This is not for every cellist, because this requires enormous skills. You have to be capable of playing very virtuosic music, and it is difficult for the stamina, because the cellist plays all the time. Really hard stuff. But it is such an enjoyable piece. And if I would point one little segment out, or let, let me point out two in this piece. Um, it's in three movements. It's a little bit odd, uh, the kind of the character of the movements, because usually a classic concerto is fast, slow, fast. This is slow, fast, and something. <laughs> so in the fast movement, the second movement, which is very long, uh, listen for the irony in the music. It's really funny what uh, Prokofiev writes. And then uh, the last movement, which is a theme with variations, um, after a lot of those variations that are actually very interesting and fun to listen, there comes uh, this moment that I always, always worship in Prokofiev. That is for me what Prokofiev stands for. There is this mm, moment of serenity and beauty that he sometimes has where you feel that you are in Russia and it is cold winter in Moscow. I have that association quite often with uh, Prokofiev in the first uh, violin concerto all the time, etc., etc., etc. This type of beauty, it's towards the end of the piece. It's astounding, and it's, I mean, just uh, maybe you, so you know where it is. There is one instrument on the stage over there, this brown box there, the celesta. The celesta, out of a piece that lasts, I think, 36 minutes, plays 45 seconds. When the celesta plays, that's when this magic moment happens. Thank you. And Alban Gerhardt, handsome young man that he is, will be signing CDs at the Classical Millennium table in the lobby at intermission. So you'll have a chance to meet him then. And there's a rumor going around that Carlos Kalmar will be signing CDs after the concert. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and if you don't have oh, yeah, that. the Oregon Symphony's new CD, Music for a Time of War, you really should get that because obviously you love the orchestra and this guy. It's a great CD recorded right here, the same it, program you did in Carnegie Hall. You have to have it. Yeah, ac actually I, it makes me smile a little bit. Uh, two, two things, because this is the very first recording that the Oregon Symphony did with me uh, at the podium. Although I am involved in that uh, CD, I have to tell you it's astounding CD. It's really, really good. And, uh, I mean, musicians, uh, after they got this new CD, they came to me and uh, we chatted about it. And they th said, we would have never thought that we actually sound so great. Now, of course, I uh, cannot end to thank the members of the Oregon Symphony for the effort they put in every concert, so they did in this uh, program. Now, the program uh, is <laughs> in the CD's music for a time of war, so it's kind of a grim CD, but uh, ever since it came out, occasionally I have, this, uh, I have the pleasure of meeting several of you and signing uh, CDs, and I hear very often that I bought this CD as a gift for Christmas, and I thought like, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool, you have a gift for Christmas, which is about peace and loving and family, and it's music for a time of war. Yeah, good. 
Well, the holidays can be stressful in lots of homes. <laughs> so put that on and everybody will have a great time. It really is a wonderful recording. I particularly like The Wound Dresser by John Adams on that CD. Uh, I mean, I was here when you did it. Uh, I was in the audience one night and in the booth with the recording guys the other night. And, but still, when I put the CD on, it was so vivid and so powerful and focused. It's just, it's just gripping. Absolutely wonderful. All right, Dvorak, Symphony Number no. 9 from the New World, because he wrote it here. He was homesick for uh, his Bohemian countryside, which he loved so much. He was terribly homesick the whole time he was in America. But he wrote some wonderful things here, including this Ninth Symphony, which we Americans like to think of as, you know, American music, kind of, sort of. But you beg to differ. Well, it's, an, it's not an American. Anybody here in the room who is native of Iowa? Yes. Yay. That's where my dad grew up, actually. Wonderful. Defiance, Iowa, one of America's great place names. I mean, I've never been to Iowa, but God, that must be a great state. Well, let's uh, go to Spillville sometime. Exactly. Yeah, where Dvorak went. Yeah, because Dvorak went to... Uh, the, the story is actually quite simple. There was this wonderful lady... Uh, with a lot of money. And she looked around in, into the, the composing classes and what music was being played and noticed there is no American music at her time. And she thought about it and then uh, he, she probably rightly deducted that we need some good proper training here in America to get composers going so that they write music that we actually want to play. So she went for one of the most famous composers in Europe and offered him an insane amount of money so that he would come. And she went to Dvorak and said, Mr. Dvorak, I want you to lead the conservatory in New York for at least a year and I'm going to pay you. Wow! And Dvorak, well, he's human. He was human. He said, yeah, <laughs> like that. <laughs> So Dvorak came and stayed in New York and uh, did a couple of very important things. Um, one of them was uh, very typical of Dvorak. He looked around and looked at the pieces that were written here in America at the time and discovered uh, what was there, meaning nothing was there. And because Dvorak was a composer that whose music is based mainly on his, the folk tunes of his own country, he said, that's exactly what Americans should do. Americans should write their classical music based on the folk tunes of the, as he said it, I quote, Negro population. And that's kind of a departure. Now, he of course taught a lot during his time. And if you listen uh, to music by his students, they sound, guess what, like Dvorak. But little by little, the composers got more and more independent and from there departed this miracle of uh, American classical music that has taken place in the, mainly in the 20th century because this uh, this part of the world, America, is for the last 80, 90 years so full of great composers. The only thing that is not true is it's not based on folk tunes by uh, the African-American population. But that's another story. Now, during his time in, uh, in America, and that's why I asked about who is from Iowa, um, Dvorak got so homesick that he couldn't stand it anymore and he hated New York. So he went to live uh, for a while into this small community in the state of Iowa called Spillville because that was full of Czech people. And he was very happy and wrote a lot of music. Okay, and out of the entire period he was here in America comes this symphony and uh, as Robert already uh, expressed, if you think this is American music, sorry, it's not. This is simply another symphony by Mr. Dvorak, and it's Czech music. And the title, From the New World, is 
to be taken literally because it refers to Dvorak writing, um, it's like writing a letter. He wrote a letter from America to the world, meaning from the new world. So the piece is mainly Czech. There is one little, uh, little melody, which is one of the most beautiful melodies Dvořák ever imagined, that can be linked to uh, Indian music, which is in the second movement, this fantastic English horn melody that our English horn player, Karl Mustang, plays so amazingly well. Um, yeah, there is a link there. But other than that, uh, it's just Czech music. Well, happy Thanksgiving anyway, Maestro Killjoy. <laughs> We're out of time. This is a really interesting concert, and it's going to be a lot of fun and very exciting. And we get to see this great cellist do impossible things with his instrument, thanks to you and your great programming. Thank Carlos Calmer. Robert McBride.